and uh, welcome to the Society Banquets. My name is Stephen Johnson, I'm the Treasurer of the Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here on, the, on this public lecture uh, occasion. Um, you're in a room which has been used by the Society of Antiquities, one of the six societies around the courtyard here, since at the, about the 1850s or 1860s. It was, these are apartments built for us, and they are filled with um, all sorts of goodies from the past, which have been left to us by, by antiquarians, fellows like me of, of the past, including uh, the, the portraits that you see on the wall here and some of the pictures which you see on the wall there. Our, our absolute star portrait is Mary Tudor, who, uh, who is actually on loan to somewhere else. So that's a facsimile at the moment, but she's off on loan in an exhibition somewhere. But she was painted by a painter called Hans Eworth in about 1554-55. So that is a contemporary portrait of Mary Tudor, of course, Henry VIII's daughter. And we have a number of other portraits around the room which I'm sure will, uh, will attract your attention in due course. And outside, if, if you're interested in Richard III, there is the cross which was found in the, at the, the site of the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, where Richard, of course, lost his life and Henry VII became king. Anyway, enough of the history lesson. Um, uh, but we're here, and, and uh, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome so many members of the public and, of course, members of the MCC who are here today, including your president and his wife and uh, David Morgan. We're very pleased to see you all here and very grateful that you've all come to this public lecture. Now, um, we always try to improve our public lecture series, so on your seats you'll have, you'll have either sat on or picked up uh, a, a little piece of paper which actually says, um, how, do, how are we doing? What, are we do what could we do better? And if during the course of today's lecture, not, not, not Howard, of course, but if, if during the course of today's lecture you could think of ways in which we could actually make this, this better for the public, better for people who come and visit, then please let us know. There'll be a tray somewhere, that blue tray over by the door. If you'd like to dump your, your um, comments in that, that's great. We launched this public lecture programme a couple of years ago to promote the work of the society, and we've had a whole eclectic series of lectures of all sorts of, 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 um, of subjects. This is the first time we've dealt with cricket. I presume we're dealing with cricket, because Simon Ross is from the pavilion, and so many members of the MCC here, and I might not hope there might be something to do with cricket, but it's the first time we've dealt with cricket and the heritage of cricket. Now, Howard Hanley um, is, is a, not only a fellow of the society here, but he's actually a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry as well. He's got a, a wide range of interests and in publications which span things like social history, English literature and English art, as well as cricket. <laughs> uh, so I, I look forward very much to his lecture today, and his lecture is called Silent Voices from the Lord's Pavilion. Well, I call that pressure. You're sitting on. <laughs> from your song, you're signing. That's um, um, first. You can hear me, okay, from the back, please. Thank you. No, this is enormous pleasure, and honestly, a great compliment to me to be allowed to give this lecture. Someone said it's a lot better here than somewhere like um, Leighton Town Hall or something. So. <laughs> and frank, frankly, the address of giving, giving a cricket lecture to a Burlington House, people did know less, especially coming from Australia, gives me some plus points, mm -hmm. very much. But I would like to thank not only the Society, but you individually, René Ledoux, and Rola Zundek outside, who did, I know how much work it costs in time, to put on a lecture like this, especially dealing with crusty old egomaniacs and so on. So, I, I, I thank you very much. Um, first of all, the two people who have to be thanked seriously is Neil Robinson, who I'm glad to see is here, from the MCC, and David Studham from Mel um, Melbourne Cricket Club, who unfortunately is not well and, can't, and couldn't come to um, without the resources of their libraries, this would be absolutely, totally impossible. And not only did they uh, allow me to look at the resources, but they uh, actually volunteered information. So thank you very much, Neil. And thank David, please, for me. I'd also like to thank my niece, Lynn, who couldn't come today because she's got work to do. Uh, your family always people a bit let you down, I imagine. But she... Um, uh, did quite a lot of work with the photography and stuff, and uh, 
It's a great shame she's not here. Right, let me make a start, please. Silent voices. Hope this works. I'm a Mac man. <laughs> the pavilion, of course, is the Lord's Pavilion, which must be known to nearly all of you, but not necessarily as well as some of the others. That's the famous Pavilion of Lords. And just for the background, um, if you're not familiar with this, the word Lords is not related to the peerage. Um, quite the contrary. It, Thomas Lord was a um, an ordinary sort of bloke. He was a very uh, enterprising man. And he was pally with the first members of what we now call the MCC. They're literally friends and they trusted him. They asked him to build um, a ground uh, or grounds on which to play. And the Lords we now know in St. John's Wood um, was open for play in 1814 and I should say that they're celebrating the bicentenary of this event. Um, of interest to the society here is a grade uh, two heritage building, it's, it's brick and ter terracotta, and it was opened in 1890. And that total cost of £21,000 is plus or minus a bit, but that's kind of absurd <laughs> to build this. And the architect was a firm run by uh, Thomas Verity, and the firm still exists. But um, he was a very famous man at the time. He designed not only Lords, but he designed the one of the West End theatres and had to do with a lot of the structures that you take total, totally for granted now. He had something to do, I think, with the Victorian Albert Museum and the Albert Hall and other stuff. So this is non-trivial, this building. It's not just a cricket pavilion, it's a serious building. Now I'm going to make the statement, I hope no one here argues with me. <laughs> This is the most single, most famous single structure in all sports. And when I say all sports, I mean all sports and with a qualification maybe of team sports. Um, I read somewhere that if someone who played in 1890 uh, was played today at Lords, they'd recognise where they were. And you can't say that of any other ground, I would, I would think. And, um, I think it's also symbolic, not just of the, um, the cricket connection. It's, this is the beginning of what we might call the modern age of sport, 1890 or plus or minus a bit. This is when sport became popular, big crowds, uh, media coverage, car to the personality, bribes, good things, and bad things, tabloids, and if they had television, it would be right there. This is the beginning, and Lord's Pavilion is the symbol of, um, of the beginning of this era. And I also think uh, there's a big social history um, context to this. Um, if, you have, if you do nothing about the social history of, let's say, England, and let's say the, the Empire even, at the time, and you looked at the records of the MCC, I think you'd get a pretty good idea of what was going on in, in the social life of, of England, because the MCC um, had a, the people, the members of the MCC, had a considerable influence in the, in the country, and they still do, especially in those days. So how the MCC reacted to games and what they did with the professionals, how they handled people, etc., etc., you make a nice little essay on the history of the history of English cricket. So I'm saying that um, if I didn't start this way, I'd start talking about the cricket signatures, and I bore you all to death. I notice there's no portraits of Don Bradman or <laughs> uh, which is an oversight. <laughs> so may I start the lecture proper, so to speak? Yes. This is one of the tiles of the pavilion, and this is what I'm talking about. This is a balcony. 
It's a bar behind the balcony. And you see here the people doing what you have to do. They may have a drink and watch the cricket. And that's just the beginning of my story. Um, I've had the privilege of being a member of going to that bar fairly often. And surprisingly, um, I looked down about four years ago. I was out on the balcony there with my beer in one hand, and I looked down, and I saw this. Written, scrawled on the balustrade of the balcony. Now I know my cricket. That's immediately W. Armstrong, Warwick Armstrong, the signature thereof. Not so well. And underneath that's a little one, Lightning, 1899. Lightning's another signature, a chap named Charlie McLeod. He was called Lightning because he was always late for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, that, that raises an eyebrow. I mean, you, you see this right in front of you. Now, you knew, well, I knew, that he played for Australia in, between 1902 and 1921. Clearly, he was a lord, otherwise it wouldn't have been. So that got me thinking. And to cut a long, huge long story short, this is a photograph of the 1902 Australian team in England. Every one of those members, can I move this grenade without destroying things? Yeah. Here's Warwick Armstrong, with the exception of the captain. Every, I think he might be there. Every one of this team has a signature or initial scroll on that balcony. Even more, the voices are these people. Not only is it 192, which I just showed you the picture. The Australians toured England in those years, 19 to 1902. Every, uh, there are about 50 odd players who toured during that time, of which about 40 would have been different because they would have come more than once. Of that 40 odd, I could easily recognize 20 of the signatures, not necessarily from 1902, and I'll show you, but even from 1890. So clearly, this was a fashion thing to do. <laughs> and so that's the voices and the pavilion, of course, is the Lord's pavilion. Now, um, this is where belonging to society really helps. It's frankly not very difficult to record the signatures and write a brief article with lots of pickies because they're right there in front of you. But when you, when you delve into this kind of thing, you get obsessed, frankly, I'm afraid, and you begin to live, live these times, what they're doing. And you mentioned, or Stephen mentioned briefly, Richard III, there was a lecture here on uh, the discovery of his remains. Well, I hope that the people who discovered that not only were unbelievably proud of the enormous significance historically, but they must have felt they were living in that time. So they didn't just look at the bones, they looked at the how he died, etc. I mean, they must have been there. Now, I don't think that Richard III is quite as important as the signatures at Lord's, <laughs> but the, um, the, the context is the same. So that's what really is going on from here on now. So let's go back to the days when these signatures were written, scrolled. 1890 to 1902. I should say before anyone asks, in 1902, the dressing rooms were changed to what you know now. They were not dressing rooms then. So after 1902, there are none of these signatures. Right, we go back. This is actually 1896. Here's the pavilion. Here's the balcony, a couple of blokes there watching. Now, this is just a parathetical remark, but I'm now going to flash that image I showed before. This is the pavilion today. If you compare the two, I mean, the MCC should take enormous pride 
in restoring or keeping this building in such, <laughs> such a historically faithful manner. Though I was reading one or two of the old tour books written by uh, the Australians who toured in the 1890s and 1900s, and one of the comments they made was there weren't enough lavatories or showers. <laughs> and I think that's been improved now, but it's still a bit of a problem. Anyway, so there's a pavilion, and it looks, I would say, the same then, now, as it then. Right. Now, this is behind the pavilion. If this works, cross fingers. This is behind the pavilion <coughs> in 1898. Now, if you don't recognize one of these gentlemen, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> here comes W.G. Grace. <laughs> and you can see his character in a second. See? <laughs> Mr. Bullshit, even in those days. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, that was taken in 1898, and I'm, I'm pretty certain it's the, um, it must be one of the oldest. Uh, the, the, this is actually gentleman players, we won't talk about them, because they're not Australians, but Grace, of course, you can't remember. Um, this, I think, it must be the oldest cricket photo. Is it not? Did anyone contradict that? Did anyone see anything older than that? I am. Never mind, move on. Okay, now this to me was a gem. I can read it if you can't see it at the back. Darling acknowledges the cheers of the crowd. Joe Darling was one of the players of the 192. He was a captain, I'm sorry, in 1899 and 192 and other teams. He was one of the people. I couldn't find his signature, but I'm sure it's there. Anyway, England lost to Australia in 1899 and had lost at Lords. And he's acknowledging the cheers of the crowd, and good heavens, I mean that. I'm sorry, this was by a chap named Frank Gillett in the daily newspaper called The Daily Graphic. So it's totally contemporary, no cheating. And there is the balustrade, absolutely. So that's where the signatures are. I was very nice, I gave you great pleasure to find them. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Okay, now here's another thing. What did he look at? And what did he see, Mr. Darling and the rest of them? That's where, that's the, that's the Lord's ground. And I'll read the bottom. This is from the Austral Australian, Australian news, news, newspaper, 1899, obviously written just about after the test started in 1899. It says, Warrell batting, Darling with him. That's the guy in the balcony. Here. Lily Wiggy Keeper ran to City in the slips. The test in the England versus Australia's second test match at Lords. That was taken without any shadow of doubt by Frank Laver, who was a member of the team and a keen photographer. So now you get some idea of standing in their footsteps. I mean, you stand there and you're looking out at that view. Admittedly, it's slightly different <coughs> than it is today. <laughs> This was taken from the roof, a little bit higher. Now, there's a dominant thing here you might see, namely the uh, media center. But, come on, use your imagination, get rid of that. It's not so much different from that. It's not the same. But the, the layout of the ground and so on and so forth is, is very much the same. So now you understand, I hope, where all this is coming from. But we came here to see some of the signatures. And I can't show them all because they're about 20 or so, and report they're not they're rather obvious, some of them. But let's have one or two. The first one JJL is Joe Lyons. 1890, clear as anything. Now he has he was a he was a flash opening batsman, very fast scorer, personality. Um, 
He's here because he was probably the first man to put his signature on the pavilion. The pavilion was opened in late May 1890. Um, I should say it's not particularly difficult to make a pretty good, good guess exactly when they did, this, did these signatures. Because first of all, if you're going to scrawl a signature, you've got to have time to do it. <coughs> so if you're in the field, you don't have time. If you're batting extremely well, you don't have time. <laughs> if it rains, you have lots of time. <laughs> okay. My guess is this was June the 2nd in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone cares to bet, I will take it. <laughs> right? You've got to remember, we're all, we're all sods now, but we're talking about guys... 2021, nowadays they would have the iPhone and tootling away when they had nothing to do. <laughs> yeah, why not do a signature? Okay. Anyway, he has pride of place. I changed the colour here because of the, I hope you see it. Um, that reads, I just changed the colour, E. Jones, 1899, June. That would be about June 12th. Ernie Jones was the first true Australian fast bowler. Um, and he's, he is in legend of cricket history. Because he bowled, he was bowling to the great W.G. Grace, the chap I showed with the big beard. And he bowled a ball which went through his beard. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt there was a frank exchange of views, but <laughs> Jones said, according to legend, sorry, doctor, she slipped. <laughs> now, whether Mitchell Johnson would do the same nowadays, <laughs> or Broad or someone, I'm not sure. But there you go, you see. Now, uh, this is a group, this is typical of a group of three. This was done in the Lord's Test in 192. I, this was done after lunch on the first day because it rained and the rain thing was rained out. There are three names. They may not mean much to modern people. That's S.E. Gregory, R.A. Duff, and A.J. Hopkins, who I doubt that many people have heard. He played for Australia without real distinction. But in this game, he had a bowl. England lost two wickets, both to him, and they were two of the most prolific batsmen of the day, namely Ranjit Sinzi and Trump. Got out for ducks. <coughs> Right? Then it rained. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. This burly, rather aggressive looking bloke is Mr. Warwick Armstrong in <coughs> later life. Later for him, I would say 1921. <coughs> At the chap who did this signature when I first showed it to you. Now, I may be reading a bit too much into this, but you can do this if you've got nothing else to do. You notice this guy obviously took some time and care to write his full name, but he completely overwrote, overwrote some poor chap who did it in 1890. <laughs> now, this, this was done in 1902. Now, <laughs> it's a mild indication of a fair amount of, I would say, selfishness, maybe. Um, I don't know. But Armstrong is famous for one of the most absolutely unbelievable incidents in test cricket. He bowled two overs in succession. <laughs> now, if you don't know the cricket laws, it may not, not mean much, but that is so staggering. It's like playing the British Open in golf and taking, missing two or three times until you get the ball on the green. I mean, it's just, it's just not done. <laughs> right? And he got away with stuff, and unfortunately, of course, he's long dead now. He turned out to be a rather aggressive um, sports writer. Here's another one, M.A. Noble, 1899. M.A. Noble was a very nice man, a very good captain of Australia, much respected. But again, he's rather famous for a reason he probably would like to forget. He bowled in the, uh, this was the MCC versus Australian game, August 1st, 1899. He bowled a ball that was hit over the pavilion at Lord's. And I've got an image here. Not of him being hit over the pavilion at Lord's. But I think this is staggering. Uh, the picture's not very good, but I hope it's clear enough. Here's a good old pavilion, of course. 
he's bowling from this end. Sorry, the bowler is bowling from this end. Yeah, sorry. Noble is bowling from this end. The batsman, who's a trot, was at this end. And whoa. <laughs> now, come on, guys. Nowadays, we have 20 20 games, and everyone gets hysterical if it lands there for six rounds. Now, bear in mind, in those days, let's face it, men were not as strong. The bats were thinner, the ball was larger. That was an incredible feat. Never been done again. There you go. Now I come to the, you might say, the keepies. I think I'll ask the audience, what's VT stand for? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Victor Trumper, 1899, clear as a button. Right? Victor Trumper um, was one of the very few iconic sports players, let alone cricketers, who was clearly, I have to use the word, adored by the public. He played, this is his first series, cricket series in England. He played, he played seriously from 1898, and he died, unfortunately, I'll come to this a little later, in 1915. During this time, he established a reputation of, of being um, not only a wonderful batsman, but fluidity, grace, charm, etc., etc. And even after a hundred years, there's still debates in Australia if how good he was compared with Don Bradman, which of course the combination is nonsense. Don Bradman, to those who don't know, is unbelievably the most prolific batsman ever. Anyway, this is his photo. Now, this is worthy of a lecture in itself. This was taken in 1902, actually at, at the Oval, not at Lord's, by a man, George Belden, who was a good, bo a good bowler for Middlesex. Now, just, just have a little think on this. This was done, obviously, at right angles to the action. And it, it was staged in the sense that he was definitely going to hit the ball, but it was not, not part of the match, it was before the match. Because there were no telephoto lens and shutter speeds were less in those days. But I can't help thinking about this picture a lot. First of all, look at this. Look at the movement in this picture. Look, that foot's coming down to the shadow. Look at the symmetry of the X here. I mean, it's a perfect picture. But what is so good about it, you see a combination. This young man, he's a, he's a handsome fellow. You see a fluidity to him. But look, I wouldn't get, I'd like to get in front of him when he's driving the ball at me. I mean, he's a serious man. So this is probably, no, I'm like, damn it, I'm not going to say probably, is the most famous picture in cricket. You'll see it universally, even every day. Any Australian cricket book, I'm guaranteed to have it someday. Now, if I die, I would like this testament. I don't think I'll die. I'm more likely to die than get this <laughs> testament to say. This is a cartoon by Frank Reynolds, 1909. Trump had toured England in 1909. I've, I've written out, the, on the top is what's written on the bottom. Tell you what, you be England and I'll be Victor Trumpet. <laughs> now notice it's not Victor Trumper, it's Victor Trumpet. So, isn't that a compliment? I think so. Now, he died at the age of 37 in 1915. And I now have a movie of his funeral in Sydney. This to me is staggering. 1915, this was August, was the ending of the disastrous Dardanelles Gallipoli campaign. 
which is huge in Australia. It's called Anzac Day. And a lot of people say it defines Australia as a mature nation. Australia loss of life, of course English was elsewhere was too. But people were unbelievably sad at this time in 1915. 20,000 people turned up for his entourage and his funeral. That's his entourage. In the middle of the war, for a guy who's just a sportsman. Pretty good. Now I'm going to change mood a little bit. What I've been talking about is called the golden age of cricket, which indeed it was in many respects. But there was a downside to all this. This was the time of the late beginning of the Industrial Revolution where England was becoming unbelievably prosperous. Everyone knows books, countless books have been written on this about the social problems in England and elsewhere due to this. And frankly, until fairly recently, most books about the Golden Age glossed over it. And recently that, that has changed. Not all the people on that who scroll their signature were heroes, young men, wonderful guys. Here's another one, and this is how a tabloid described him in Sydney. <laughs> okay. Now, I think even in this day and age, a newspaper would might hesitate <laughs> to, um, to write that. Um, this was Arthur Cunningham. That's a conning eye. It, it's it definitely there. I had to change the color a little bit. Now, he, was a, he only played once for Australia, but he had the enormous distinction. This is 1893 when he played this. <coughs> I'm sorry, scroll this. But he played in Australia in 1904, in Australia, for, for Australia. He has the distinction, his first ball in Test cricket got a wicket, and that was not only his first ball, it was the first ball of the Test match. Not bad start, huh? He was dropped after the game. <laughs> um, he also was a hero because when he was touring in 93, he rescued a boy from drowning in the Thames. That's the good side. I'll read this. <laughs> At the end of the tour, 93, he was in Blackpool and he was fed up. And he, he, he started a little fire in the outfield and set fire to the grass and stuff. He was, he was tired and cross and fed up. The next line, he sued a Catholic priest. Uh, you can read that at the back, okay? okay? Now, this was totally non-trivial. Absolutely. Um, in, this is 1900, approx. In 1900, the Catholic Protestant issue was very much uh, a sticking point in Australia. He was Protestant, the Catholic priest, obviously, was Catholic. Now, the Catholics said that he didn't want to sue him. He didn't want to um, go to have a divorce trial. He just wanted to blackmail the Catholic priest. He was hoping to get money. His wife agreed that she had misbehaved. And in fact, Cunningham himself said at the time of conception of the alleged child who was born, he was not capable of surrogate due to a cricket injury. Um, <laughs> I let you all shudder about what the cricket industry might have been. <laughs> anyway, he had one trial, which was a mistrial, and the second one he went into court with a revolver and he lost. <laughs> anyway, that was that was really serious. He was sent to jail for fraud later on. He was divorced by his wife for committing adultery. I like the little phrase in a beach house, it adds a bit of colour <laughs> to it. <laughs> and he, poor chap, he did die in a mental hospital. Now, I'm, we're, making this, we're making a little bit of a joke of this, but I'm going to show you something where all this stuff is not a joke. I'm going back to a remark I made about 
the downside that, that of the late Victorian era and the Edwardian era. Um, there was a great deal of discontent in the cricket world, which was glossed over. Particularly the English professionals had a very rough life. Even if you played for England, it didn't guarantee you anything much. There was a strike in 1896 against uh, the, the professional strike against the uh, selection committee. It was the Oval. They actually backed down. They wanted more than £10 a game for playing for England. <coughs> Sham amateurism, you know that phrase, was very popular. W.T. <coughs> Grace made a fortune. He was an amateur. He made a total fortune out of the game, which I guess he deserves. I'm not knocking him. Anyway, there's a great deal of discontent. Don't let me down. spoil everything. This is the Melbourne Cricket Club, sorry, the Melbourne Cricket Ground scoreboard, 1895. Uh, right in the middle of the era I'm talking about, and many of the players, of course not the English, but the Australian players who played in this day, this test match, did put their signatures on the Lord's Pavilion balcony when they came to England. I'm just going to make this comment. Of the, of the people you see here, two committed suicide. Trot and Stoddard. Two ended their life in a loony bin. Trot and Brockwell. And of the 22 players who um, played in that game, four committed suicide and eight died in a lunatic assignment. Now, 8 out of 22 is an abnormal percentage. Uh, I'm bringing that up because, well, frankly, I find it fascinating. And, and I don't think Mr. Frith is in the audience, um, but he wrote a book, David Frith, on the, um, I won't say abnormal, but certainly uh, above, way above average suicide rate. And there was a lovely article by Peter Roebuck, who himself committed suicide. Peter Roebuck was a journalist. And the big argument is, what does cricket do to you? <laughs> or have you got the temperament that makes you like cricket, but also has these bad things? Now, that's awfully gloomy. Let's end on a more cheerful note. <coughs> Quiz. Name those two people, please. And chat with a moustache. Who is he? Correct. Arthur Conan Doyle. Name the chap, the younger man on the other side. I know someone knows the answer. Woodhouse? Correct. P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> okay. Both these guys played on the same team several times around this time, 1900 up to 95. They played for teams like authors versus artists or something versus publishers and that sort of thing. They played at Lords. This is it's documented. They played at Lords. And I know that they were in that dressing room where the so-called famous players were. I've looked hard to see if at least I could see a P PGW, but I haven't. But I'd like to end on rather a nice note, I think, to prove I'm right. <laughs> Woodhouse, well, first of all, let me, before we get to that, people should know, if you don't know already, that Conan Doyle was a complete cricket nut, cricket tragic, he's called in Australia. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is named after Shylock. Chatlock, Notting, a Notting, um, Nottinghamshire player. And Woodhouse, the famous Jeeves, is named after cricketer Percy Jeeves. That's Dr. Woodhouse has written that down. Conan Doyle got one wicket in first class cricket. It was W.G. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> but they were playing together. 
And Woodhouse made his name as an author, sort of semi-autobiographical, around 1900 plus or minus, a little later. He had stories about a chap named Mike. Mike, the story started out with him as being a senior schoolboy, but then he went into the city because his parents couldn't afford him to take time off to play cricket, and he hated it, and he, he ducked out to play cricket. Now, Woodhouse did that himself, but the stories are about Mike doing exactly the same thing. And one of the short stories called Mike at Lords, Mike gets a phone call from his brother, who really played for Sussex, who's playing Middlesex at Lords. The brother says, please come right now to Lords, we need you to play. I mean, he was good enough to play, Mike. Mm -hmm. So Mike dashes over to Lords, and he's worried about losing his job, blah, 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 because he's missing the bank. But in the book, I now quote, this is what Mike does after getting there. He changed and went out into the little pavilion, which barked me the top of the pavilion. I think that means that Woodhouse was there without any shadow of doubt. So one day, maybe I'll find his signatures. And I think at that point, thank you, I will end. Thank you.